Hello and welcome back to the Karma Stories Podcast. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today I have three stories for you from the Malicious Compliance subreddit. The Karma Stories Podcast is published to all major podcasting platforms and you can also read along on YouTube under our at Karma Stories Podcast handle. If you'd like to submit your own story to the podcast, you can do so at karmastoriespod at gmail.com. All right, on to today's compliance stories. Let's jump right in. This story comes to us from Mosey the Lion. HR and payroll manager asked to automate their decisions away. In my first job, I worked in IT as an access and permissions administrator at a large company with significant technological debt. The environment included custom software dating back to the Windows 9 era and even DOS era. Initially, the work was quite tedious, involving a lot of back and forth communication between multiple departments. We had to ensure that each employee had the necessary training and documentation to access data in the scope requested by their manager. Additionally, we needed approval from the manager of the department related to the system role in question. On top of that, the company's excessive paper-only bureaucratic workflow made the work go at a snail's pace. A single SAP account for a blue-collar worker required at least three forms signed by different people. The heads of departments responsible for signing those papers didn't feel any urgency to send them to us quickly. A good example of this is when I, myself, waited over two weeks after being hired in the IT department before my first account was set up. Until then, I only had a guest account that allowed me to access the main internal website with the company's procedures, regulations, and other basic information. Up to this point, each signed form had to be physically delivered to us, which was agonizingly slow given that the company had multiple branches. We decided to automate away the paperwork. Our first step was to allow the use of scanned documents. It was a partial success. While it eliminated the courier delays, management still required us to sign the physical copies afterward, which we mass stamped at the end of each month. The next step was to introduce a fully electronic workflow. We faced significant resistance from upper management, so we had to settle on a system that mostly replicated the existing paper process. Despite this, it was a game changer. We created presets that managers could select and customize as needed, using data from these customizations to create better fitting presets. We also developed workflows that automatically generated and assigned sub-tickets for necessary approvals, and tracked how long it took, sending reminders if needed. And finally, we got an approval from HR to access layoff data to generate user block and removal tickets. Some time after we rolled out the new system, the HR and payroll manager made a big fuss. She was furious that her team was still waiting weeks to get their permissions and questioned whether all our work had been for nothing. That really struck a chord with me. Inside, I was overjoyed, but I did my best to keep a neutral expression. At that time, we were working on summary reports with burn down and bottleneck charts, and I already knew that tickets requesting HR and payroll access were spending over most of their lifespan waiting for her or one of her sub-managers to approve them. The manager immediately went on the defensive, claiming she couldn't keep up with the amount of tickets. She then requested a change. She wanted any request from her employee to be automatically approved within the relevant scope of their sub-department. For example, a request for an HR worker to have full HR access and limited payroll access would be automatically approved for HR access, but not for payroll, and vice versa. I was skeptical, but weren't exactly in a position to argue. I asked my boss to join the discussion and explained that the goal was to prevent overly permissive approvals that could lead to unauthorized access. I tried to convince her to brainstorm together potential edge cases before making a blanket approval, but she was already set on her decision and wasn't interested in discussing details. My boss shrugged and said it would be her responsibility. He told her to write up an official document outlining the change and we would proceed with the implementation. The only request we had was to include a line that each such request would still be created, assigned to as normal, and marked as automatically approved by name of the main HR and payroll manager's decision. 
I uploaded the scan into our system and, anticipating that it would eventually backfire, made a photocopy to keep it handy in the top drawer of my desk. The original copy went to the archive. A few weeks later, she stormed into our room. The speed with which she flung open the door made it clear she was furious. She demanded to know why we had granted full access to payroll data to her subordinate. I think it was the only time I ever heard anyone yell in the company. I calmly reminded her of her request to automatically approve in-department access requests. She wasn't having it, explaining that one of her low-ranking subordinates from the payroll sub-department had accessed the salaries of everyone in their department, including managers, and was unhappy with the paycheck disparity. Isn't that obvious that they shouldn't be able to do that? Well, yeah, to a human, but that decision was automated away by your request. I handed her a copy of the document she had signed, which instructed us to automatically approve any and all such tickets without exception. Immediately afterward, she asked us to roll back the change while she wrote up another document to cancel the previous one. In the following days, she meticulously reviewed all those tickets and requested us to reduce access for several users. I have to admit, she did a thorough job and kept up a good pace in reviewing new requests, doing it daily instead of once every week or two as before. In the end, we managed to distill a subset of permissions that could be approved automatically and proceeded to implement a similar approach with other departments. P.S. I don't know whether that payroll employee managed to get the raise, but I'm sure they weren't fired as we didn't receive any tickets to block or remove any accounts from that department in the following months. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Fire 76 It says, I loathe the culture in the U.S. that keeps people from discussing salary. I won't talk about how much I make to people outside the company, but I will flat out tell people I work with how much I make. If it means more people end up getting paid what they're worth, then great. Another commenter down below called Virgil Reality said, Learning is an inherently painful process. Sounds like she learned a lot from this. OP responded to this one and said, She learned a lot from that experience, but perhaps not enough. Sometime later, she forgot to inform us that an optional certified training program our company was sending us on had exceeded the standard budget and required us to sign a two-year loyalty contract in advance. She was tasked with ensuring we signed these, but forgot and went on vacation. By the time she returned, we had completed the training and everyone received the contract afterward. It said that each month would remove 1 24th of the obligation, and if you quit early, you'd have to pay the remaining balance. The contract was also pre-filled with a false signing date that predated the training, awaiting only our signatures. I was the only one who refused to sign it. She threatened to make it impossible for me to get a promotion. Since I was already considering looking for another job, I handed my resignation that very same day. After that, she tried to negotiate by offering a contract for just the amount that exceeded the standard budget. But by then, I had already received the push I needed to pursue a better paying career. Most companies that I've worked for in the past have been very adamant that you don't talk about your salary to anybody else in the company. It really does seem like par for the course up here in Canada, and it's the same down in the US as well. In Ontario where I live, government workers are on a list if they make over $100,000 in a year, but that doesn't really show you the disparity between somebody who's earning 50 grand a year and somebody who's earning 98 grand a year. Also, I'm not sure how this is anywhere else, but in Ontario, Canada, employees have the right to discuss their salaries based on the Pay Transparency Act and the Employment Standards Act. So if your boss is telling you not to talk to any of your coworkers about how much you make, <laughs> you can tell them that they don't have the right to do that. This story comes to us from Simo41, doing exactly what I was told. I used to work as a driver for a freight company. We used to handle awkward sized items that no other couriers would touch. We delivered everything from coffins to tractor parts. We also had to collect things from our customers for delivery the next day. This company had a mixture of contractors and permanent drivers. I was a relief driver. I knew most of the routes, so I covered holidays or sickness. 
The management of the depot consisted of a delivery manager and a collection manager. These two people didn't quite see eye to eye, as sometimes getting the stuff delivered conflicted with getting stuff collected, and their targets reflected failures in a bad way. This particular day, I had to cover a contractor's route. I didn't know the route, so as we had to load our trucks, this took a little longer than usual. I had around 45 deliveries that day, which is high for this predominantly rural route. I asked my manager, the delivery manager, if he knew the route. He replied that he did and ordered my route for me. So I was good to go, albeit a bit late. I did say that with that volume I had, I may struggle and asked him to keep an eye out for me. He said, okay. I got to near midday and realized that I wasn't going to be able to complete all the deliveries and the collections wouldn't get done either. I also noted that one of the collections was off route and the contractor had a vehicle in that area anyway. I called in and spoke to my manager and told him he had a choice of collections or deliveries. I also asked why the contractor couldn't cover the off route collection. I was told to call back later and he'll see if he can sort something out. He also said that the off route collection would have to be done too. I called back later and asked for help again. He said there was no help available. So I gave him the option of deliveries or collections as there wasn't time to do both. I will get to the time a bit later. He categorically said both had to be done. The delivery manager went home, so I called in again and got the collection manager. She reiterated that there was no help at all, so either I failed the deliveries or failed the collections. If that happened, I'd have been hauled into the office the next day. So cue malicious compliance. I called into one of the collections and asked what time they closed. 6.30 p.m. they said, so I said I'd be back later. I carried on with the deliveries, which took me further away from that collection. At the appropriate time, I stopped delivering and drove to the collection. I collect two small parcels, that was all. I then drove back to where I had stopped and carried on delivering. This cost me about an hour. I finished my last delivery at 7.15 p.m. I had a 45 minute drive back to my yard. As I was leaving the round, I got a frantic call from the collection manager. She was wondering where I was. I told her what had happened and told her that I'd asked for help four times and was told I had to do everything allocated, so I did, and it wasn't my fault that it happened like this. Here's where the trouble really started. The company's trunking system is a fluid one. It depends on trucks leaving the depot at a certain time. For our depot, the cutoff time is 7.30 p.m. I wheeled in at just after 8 p.m. There were 15 pissed off guys on overtime waiting for me to turn up and an articulated truck waiting for these two parcels. This wait caused the whole trunking system to be late the next day. My routing was discussed when I got back as it was questionable at best. When I told the collections manager that it was the delivery manager that organized it, there were angry emails between the delivery and collection managers, and I would imagine that the logistics team would have demanded an explanation too. Arses were definitely kicked. The next day, no one said a word. I wasn't on that route and going forward, well, for a little while, they either helped when I asked or didn't get me to do as much. Also, as I had exceeded legal driving time, they had to make sure I went home early for a few days, so a bit of a win there. The biggest trouble these guys had was they always assumed that the drivers were after an easy day, and even when presented with the evidence, assumed that you were still trying to be fly. This time, it bit them badly. Jumping down to the comment section on this one, we have one from a user called Novel Simplicity. It says, Bravo. Let me guess, both managers had never actually done the job they managed. OP responded to this one and said, One did, but his father-in-law worked in the office and made sure he wasn't overworked like the rest of us. Even though one of those managers previously did the job, it sounds to me like they're so far removed from that job that they just don't remember how it goes anymore. It's a classic case of poor management and lack of communication. When you're the person that's out on the front lines doing the actual grunt work and you tell them it's just not going to get done on time, there's no reason for them not to listen to you. It's almost like their ability to reason disappears and they're only worried about the image of their department and themselves 
to the higher-ups when you're not back in time. This story comes to us from Dry Lawyer 1931, following the process. Before I became a manager at another location, I worked in a store and we had a mechanic who had done something which was stupid and against the rules, but it turned into being blown out of all proportion. He was out on a road test in a customer's car after finishing some work and he stopped off in a shop to buy something. It was against the rules to use customers' cars for personal use, even on a road test. His manager was fairly new to the role, and the mechanic knew he was going to be in trouble, but did not think it would be a big deal, as in the past, it would most likely be a telling off as a verbal warning, or possibly a written warning. This mechanic was very good, and very productive, and made them lots of money, so they could not afford to get rid of him. However, the new manager decided that he would go all official and hold a full disciplinary meeting. The mechanic asked me if I would act as someone to go in with him to take notes, etc., which was allowed. Before him, though, I did try and speak to the manager and suggest this could all be dealt with. However, he said he was following the process and expected everyone to do the same. I then spoke to the mechanic and got the background and what had gone on in the investigation meeting beforehand, which I realized had been mishandled also. The next day, there was an office with two people from HR who had traveled a long way to this meeting. I said to the mechanic, just go along with it as I indicate. So the HR people and the manager are there, and so are both of us, and the manager starts to go off about what had happened, and that he had been seen by the customer stopping off to buy a drink in the local shop. He then went on about rules and procedures, and this went on and on. At the end of it, I asked if we could take a break for a bit, which they agreed to. And then we went back, and to make the point, he decided to bring in another mechanic to confirm they knew the policy, which he said he did. And I said that I could not be sure that everyone did. So one by one, they brought each mechanic up and asked them, and also started on, did they know what the accused had done, etc, etc. Fully smug at what the manager had proved, I again asked for a break, as this had been going on for some time. Of course, HR agreed and I made them wait a good 20 minutes before we went back. At this point, one of the HR people were getting frustrated at the amount of time this was taking and then asked the mechanic, so what do you have to say for yourself? You did know the rules and you did stop off? Yes, said the mechanic. I know it was wrong and I'm sorry for breaking the rules. The HR person looked stunned and said, so why did you say you did not? I never did, said the mechanic. At no point did he ask me if I had done it, only that he had to follow the process. At which point the second HR person said, No one asked you what you had to say about it? No, he did not, the mechanic answered. At that point, they did not look best pleased. I was trying hard not to laugh at it all, and looked down at my notes so they could not see my face. The HR person said, well, a verbal warning would go on the file, not to do it again, and we could leave the room, and they thanked me for my taking part. We all got up to leave, but they said to the manager to stay behind, and I closed the door. I listened and could hear them giving the manager a hard time over the waste of time. The next day, when the manager run off the productivity report, it was really bad as all the time lost by the other mechanics whilst they gave their evidence. I would have loved to see him have to explain that one to his bosses. He avoided HR where possible after that, and never asked me to follow the process again. Does it sound to anybody else like OP has some major union experience behind their back? They seem to be the most level-headed person in that whole meeting, and they managed to drag it out for a whole day, wasting everybody's time and wasting the company a bunch of money in the process. I've got to be honest for this one though, if I heard that a mechanic had taken my car and used it for a personal reason, I would be absolutely pissed. I'd also feel like they would deserve all the punishment that was coming to them because that's just not something you do. If you enjoy daily Reddit stories, I encourage you to follow and add us to your favorites on whichever podcasting platform you enjoy the most. And if you're watching and listening on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button and drop a like on the video. It really helps us out. I thank you for watching and listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.